Okay, the next uh, paper is uh, from Toronto um, on coded two bucket cameras for computer vision. And the talk will be presented uh, by Mian Wei. Uh, hi, today I'm happy to share with you all our very first results from a four year long effort at the University of Toronto to build a new family of computational cameras, including designing and fabricating the CMOS sensor itself that will enable a powerful new type of programmable imaging for computer vision. Our camera is designed to overcome two basic trade-offs in imaging. The first is about 3D imaging of dynamic scenes with active light sources. On the one hand, we know how to build high-accuracy 3D models of static scenes by capturing images sequentially with different illumination conditions. But these techniques have not been practical for dynamic scenes. And that's because even small motion can break the assumptions used when imaging at standard video rate. Now, one solution is to use a high-speed camera, but this result, this requires bright lights and low noise sensors to compensate for the short exposure times, both of which are power-hungry and expensive. Now, on the other hand, we can capture dynamic scenes at low cost by either relying on sparse measurements from a single image or on a time-of-flight sensor but in both cases, we end up with much less accurate models. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could program a video camera to output nearly simultaneous views of a scene for any number of illuminations we want while still operating at standard video rates? That's exactly what our camera can do, and it's the main focus of my talk. The second trade-off is specifically about the technique of coded exposure imaging. Over the last decade, this technique has given us exciting new capabilities, such as acquiring high-speed video from a single image, acquiring live direct-only and indirect-only video, and analyzing the AC flicker of light bulbs. To do all this, the camera must be programmed to repeatedly block and unblock light from reaching arbitrary pixels. But this is inefficient because, every, because we lose light every time a pixel is blocked. It also makes the cameras really bulky because flexible imaging has so far relied on relay optics and physical masks. The sensor we design can do, this, can do all this electronically on chip. So it can go behind any optics we want, and at the same time, it collects all the incident light. So how does our camera work? Well, let's look inside it to see how our pixels differ from those in standard video cameras. A conventional pixel has two parts, a photosensitive region that generates electrical charges in response to light, and a bucket that accumulates them. This accumulation starts at the beginning of each frame, and the total accumulated value is read out at the end of the frame. Our pixel, on the other hand, has two buckets that can accumulate charges, as well as a one-bit memory, memory that specifies which bucket should be actively accumulating charge at any given instance. This bit can be programmed by us to flip any number of times during a frame. So a pixel can begin a frame by sending charges to bucket one, then switch to bucket zero, and then switch back again. And just like in a conventional pixel, the charges are read out only at the end of the frame. But our pixels outputs two values instead of just one. Now the sequence of bucket activations is controlled by a binary vector whose length and contents are programmable. Each bit represents an equal slice of the frame's exposure time, which we call a subframe. And so we can see how this code vector was used to control the previous pixel. By changing the code vector, we change how the pixel accumulates light into the two buckets. So light is never blocked, just sorted into buckets. Now, each pixel on our sensor can be programmed independently. So the sensor takes as input a code matrix that specifies its pixel's behavior over the exposure. Even though, our, even though our sensor is the first CMOS image sensor with this functionality, it's a generalization of two types of sensors that have been around for a few years already. Continuous wave time of flight cameras, like those in the Connect 2, actually have two buckets in them. But they don't have the memory bit. So the active bucket is always the same for all pixels. These sensors can't be used in applications that require per-pixel masking, and they can't capture images for more than two illuminations at once. 
sensors that support electronic pixel masking have the opposite effect. They do have the memory bit to mask pixels independently, but they don't have the second bucket. So they lose whatever light falls onto the masked pixels. There have even been four bucket sensors fabricated, but the extra buckets leave little room for the photosensitive region. And of course, because there's no masking, acquiring four illuminations at once is the upper bound for these sensors. Now, our sensor, on the other hand, makes it really easy to acquire nearly simultaneous full resolution views for whatever illuminations we want. And we do this in three steps. We first configure our sensor to output what we call a two bucket illumination mosaic. This is a pair of images, one per bucket, that pack reduced resolution views corresponding to different illuminations, both not exactly the ones we want. This, this mosaic is output at standard video rate. We then upsample these views to full res with a demosaicing algorithm and reconstruct the views we actually want by demultiplexing. Now, to acquire such a mosaic, we change both the scene's illumination and the active bucket of each pixel many times during each frame. We split the frame into S subframes, and in each subframe, we use the ith illumination and load the ith bit of each pixel's code vector. Now, for scenes with lots of fast motion, we cycle through our illuminations n times during a frame, so that illuminations are never too far apart in time. Now, the inputs to this procedure are a matrix that stores each illumination as a row vector, a small neighborhood whose pixels will be assigned a distinct code vector, and a code matrix that stores these vectors. So, subframe is fully described by a row of L and a corresponding column is C. So, now here's a close up of what these mosaics look like. For a neighborhood of three pixels, we get a total of three illuminations per bucket, for a total of six illuminations per frame. And upsampling them is very easy because we can use a conventional demosaicing algorithm. To do this, we start with a three pixel neighborhood and make it square by assigning one of the three code vectors to the fourth pixel to mimic the structure of color filtered tiles in a standard camera. So the mosaic contains another quarter res image whose illumination is identical to one of the other three. We can now just feed the mosaic to a standard algorithm. Of course, this happens for both buckets during video acquisition. And better ways to upsample the mosaic are certainly possible. But our camera also gives us a completely different option. We can apply our vision algorithms to bucket ratios, which are much less dependent on albedo. So we can compute these ratios directly from a two bucket mosaic and work with them for the rest of the pipeline. Although at this point we have full res views of the scene, they're not exactly the ones we want. And that's because a pixel's bucket may be active for more than one illumination condition, meaning that the bucket's intensity will correspond to a sum of two or more illuminations. More generally, the illuminations of the bucket one images are given by the product of the code matrix and the illumination matrix. And the illuminations for bucket zero are given by the product of the binary complement of the code matrix and the illumination matrix. So combining the bucket's contents, we have a single linear relation between the illuminations we have and the illuminations we want, defined by a non square multiplexing matrix. And recovering the original illumination is just a simple matter of multiplying the illuminations we get with the pseudo inverse of the multiplexing matrix. And this relation applies to both intensities and ratios, so we can use it to get back the views we want. Now, in the paper, we analyze how to choose our camera's parameters so that the SNR of the demultiplex intensities and ratios is maximized. And the bottom line is this. We need as many subframes as illuminations we want to capture, and we need a neighborhood of at least S minus one pixels. So we can pack three illuminations in a two pixel tile, four illuminations in a three pixel tile, and so on. We also derive a construction for the optimal code matrix by extending the theory of optimal multiplexing to the case of two bucket imaging. OK, so now that we have a way to capture S full resolution views essentially at the same time, we can use whatever reconstruction technique we want that takes them as input. We focused on two of the simplest and oldest methods available linear disparity and albedo estimation 
from four phase shifted cosine patterns and linear no normal and albedo uh, estimation from four source photometric stereo. We also provide an intensity ratio formulation of these problems so that we can use them in our bucket ratio pipeline. And I can say more about them in our poster this afternoon. Our paper has both simulations and a quantitative evaluation of these methods that I'll discuss at our poster, but here I'll just focus on live imaging. And here's a few details about our sensor. It actually contains two pixel arrays, a large slower array that support up to four subframes, and a smaller test array that is 50 times faster. We're still configuring this array, so all the experiments I'll show are done with the slow array. Here's an example of live normal and albedo estimation for a deformable and very colorful object using four LEDs for illumination. Despite the low resolution of our sensor, the normals do capture the surface deformations, except for pixels and shadows of one of the lights. And here's an example of recovering normals and albedo for a face. And here I've got my camera set up for structured light, so we'll see if I can move on to a live demo. So I don't know what you guys see, but here is um, the output of our camera. Can we dim the lights a little bit? Yep, so here you can see my hand. And you can kind of make out some of the sinusoids that are uh, in the camera. And it's a little bit better if we look at the disparity map. So I'm just going to run that now. Uh, I'm going to take that and we'll it back here. And I'll just capture. Right, so here's the disparity map. And there's a bit of a lag. So here's my hand. Can't see it. Oh, I can see it there. So you can see my hand as I move it. We can pick up the subtle changes in my hand. And here I've got an object that's a little bit more colorful. Now, <clears throat> as I've said before, we can configure our camera to, do, to apply any arbitrary pa patterns to the pixels. So we'll do just that right now, where I'll show an example where we project a bunch of shapes. Right, so here, it's a little bit hard to tell. So I'm going to switch over to a pattern that's all white. And now you can see here, indeed, that we are looking at two complementary patterns in the buckets, and we're, we're able to collect all the light and apply, arbitra and apply arbitrary patterns. So the sensor I've talked about is just the first of a whole family of CMOS sensors that we're designing and fabricating at the University of Toronto. And we're already testing a quarter VGA version of the sensor in our lab, as well as sensors with other advanced features. And even though the algorithms we've implemented give promising results, generalizing existing vision techniques to make the most out of such a sensor is wide open. To facilitate this, we want to make a few C2B prototypes available to the research community for free. If you're interested in using one, please come talk to me or Kiros at the conference or send us an email. Thank you. And we're going to have an informal demo uh, at the end of the session. Thank you. Um, questions? I'll start with one. So, I was wondering when there is relatively little light in the environment. Sorry, I can't hear you. With, with low light, yeah. uh, is that actually a problem for those ratios, the ratios you use? Um, for low light, so if there's low light, if it's a problem with ratios, I mean, if there's low light, there's a lot less SNR, right? So that means even if we're using ratios or intensities, there's going to be a problem. Um, in the paper, we do talk about a noise model for the ratios. So I think um, I don't see that there will be too much of a difference between the SNRs, between um, the, what you should get in the intensity and the uh, ratio ratios that you get. Other questions, or I can ask mine. Um, so si similar to yeah, Michael's, when you look at fast motion, now you're, you're capturing temporally. You, you, you have some ability to try to kind of separate uh, motions. Have you, have you tried deconvolving images that are um, captured using your sensor to try to, to get slow motion frames out? 
So right now, we're only able to support four subframes. So we're not actually able to interleave them to uh, deal with uh, motion artifacts that are appearing. Now, we're having the, sec the next two sensors are going to be much faster, and they're going to have a lot more subframes. So um, there will be much less motion blur between the different subframes that exist. Um, but isn't, there, isn't that part of the opportunity that you have two subframes now? Yeah. Or you, have, you, can dis you can distinguish two subframes, yep. right? So you can try to, to flutter your shutter, right, in a, in a way to... Yes. Um, yeah, that is something that's... But you haven't tried might it? Be we haven't tried it yet, no. Um, but we are thinking about how we can deal with motion blur okay. uh, with these cameras. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Okay, then let's thank the speaker one more time.